The best old time radio from people you trust. The Radio Nostalgia Network, where the oldies are still young. In the dream, you are falling, lost in the listening distance, as dark locks in. Mortmain by John Metcalf. Dramatized for radio by Rebecca Wilmshurst. With Robert Glenister as John, Helena Breck as Salome, and David March as Humphrey Child. The action of the play takes place somewhere in the south of England before the last war. Mortmain. Listen to the sea, a primal sound, that sound of water washing the shore, soothing troubled spirits. I often come here for your sake, Sal, right at this very spot and look out and remember. Memories are all I've left from those few precious days when we both thought you were mine at last. But you were never truly mine. Were you? You belonged to him. He possessed from the start. That fateful day when you became his wife. I was at the church. You never knew that, did you? But I had to go. See for myself. I, Humphrey Ramsden Child, take thee, Salome Claire Miles, to be my lawful wedded wife. I, Salome Claire Miles, take thee, Humphrey Ramsden Child, to be my lawful wedded husband. He, middle aged, sallow, solid, defective. <laughs> And his mother, Harriet, veiled and slumped in a wheelchair at the back, gibbering throughout the ceremony. I never understood till later. And in the midst of it all, you, my darling, a sacrificial lamb. Perfection. The moon's up already. You look flushed, my dear. Oh, do I? I suppose I am a bit. It's just I'm glad it's all over the ceremony. I feel I can be more relaxed now. Begin to the enjoy myself. The ceremony was the consecration of our vows, Salome. It may be unduly formal to some, but for me it is most fitting for such an important moment in our lives. Of course, I wasn't meaning to be critical. I take all my marriage vows seriously, every one of them. Meaning I don't? For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. That's how much we are now part of one another, together from now on. Till death us do part? Oh, no. Not just until then, but beyond. <laughs> That's my conviction, Salome. Marriage joins more than our hearts, it binds our souls, beyond death, throughout eternity. After that, I tried to forget, to stop thinking about you both, together. The pain was still too great. And about two years later, that letter came begging me to meet you. It took courage, you knew that. But in that curious little tea shop, you offered a picture of life at Seaton Manor with Humphrey. His passions for boating, for moths, his house, the small talk of marriage. His mother. I wasn't convinced that you were entirely honest. But I listened, and against my better judgment, I accepted your invitation. I always found it difficult to say no to you, Sal. And you'd assured me I'd have little to do with Humphrey. But on a balmy September night in 1938, I found myself sitting on that ill-fated houseboat of his. Put on the gramophone, Mary. Uh, good old Humphrey, always one to defy superstition. Uh, how do you mean? Well, count, how many places? Thirteen. Thirteen to dinner. Very unlucky, some would say. Did you say thirteen? Oh, my God, Teddy's right. That's
wrong, Florence. Did you realise there were 13 of us? Of course. You would. You mean this was intense? Naturally. And then you're not superstitious? About 13 seated at dinner. Yes. Of course I'm superstitious. But I have always maintained that human fear can be used to good effect. Humph, dear, make yourself clear. I'm not following this one little bit. I think Florence means that it's bad luck to seek 13 at I dinner. I know she does. It could mean someone's going to die or something like uh, that at any yeah. rate. Yeah, not another death. Oh, don't worry yourself, Heather. It's a bit of nonsense. Is there a play which starts with the guests suddenly realising that they make 13 at the table, it's but by Priestley or someone? Barry, I think. Ah, you spoke, Mr Temple. I was just clarifying something for your wife, that's all. Of course, there's no truth in this consequent death business, but it makes a damn fine topic for table conversation, doesn't it, Mr Temple? Nothing better than to stir up the crew's complacency just before embarking on a substantial meal, don't you think, Mr Temple? You've all found your places. Salome has made such exquisitely delicate little name tags for you all. And now the first course, I think. What a little moonlight can do so, you're a friend of Humphreys, Mr. Temple. Oh, uh, please, uh, call me John, Miss... I'm um, Heather Fleming. That's my husband, Andrew, sitting over there next to Edward Scrivener. And I'm not exactly a friend of Mr. Child's. I've known Sal, uh, Salome, since we were children. Oh, really? Oh, that's nice. Well, nice for her. Ah, here's the main course. Humphrey always serves superb food, quite delicious. You get bored. You can't resist Everything looks so beautiful, darling, just like dining on a big Atlantic liner. I'd enjoy myself a good deal more if that infernal Fleming woman stopped gossiping with your friend. Oh, Heather, oh, she's a dear, and she doesn't gossip. She's just trying to feel at home. I don't see any right of hers to make people feel at home. She's my guest, yet she insists on masquerading as some pretentious oh, that's hostess. That's absurd. What's got into you tonight? This is meant to be a happy occasion, our wedding anniversary. Yes, oh, but do I... keep your voice down. She'll hear you. Well-intentioned. And the... You've always said so. She's a good woman. Well, now I find her presence intolerable. Oh, we couldn't have excluded the Flemings tonight. Heather loves coming, and she's always been like a mother to me. <coughs> Andrew's all right. I can't think how the old boy tolerates that infernal prattle day in, day out. If she belonged to me, I'd find a way to silence her, teach her a lesson. <laughs> Yes, you do no worse than making an example of Florence. She's so vulgar. That awful laughter. If ever a man suffered constant humiliation, it's not Andrew Fleming, but Ted. As always, you miss my point. There is no pretension in Oki. She is clean, unadulterated cheapness. An exquisite concoction of all that is worldly and destined for the moth and rust. Sometimes you talk in riddles. Not till you solve them. You seem to laugh and to smile just all of the while. Of course, it came as a great surprise to us when Humphrey announced he was getting married. A confirmed bachelor married to Seaton Manor in this old boat. And of course, there was his mother, you know, absolutely devoted to where he was. Took her death very much to heart. Oh, really? Well, they said it was senile dementia, and it was worse than that, and the poor dear eventually had to be committed. Must have been all of eight years ago now. I never realised. Humphrey never breathes a word. Well, it's not the sort of thing one broadcasts, is it? <laughs> dear, you think me a morbid old thing talking like this over such a lovely meal, and when I have a charming young man for company. <laughs> now, don't misunderstand me, John. We're so glad Salome came into Humphrey's life when she did. There was a time we really feared he'd go the same way as his mother. You see, the locals started spreading all kinds of rumours. Strange behaviour and all that. We never saw any evidence of it ourselves, and we never set store by any such gossip. One can't in the country. Personally, I just think Humphrey's one of life's eccentrics. He certainly has an individual taste in clothes. All this gossip started about ten years back. People claimed that Humphrey was indulging in unnatural practices, whatever that might mean. They say he stole dogs from the village and took them back here to the estate. They were never seen again. And then... Headless sheep were supposedly found entangled in some barbed wire at the entrance to the manor. They claimed Humphrey had ritualistically slaughtered them. Oh, 
dreadfully far-fetched, and quite honestly, I did. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention for a minute? Yeah, okay, please. Oh, oh, okay. I'd like to propose a you. toast to the happy couple. I give you up and Salome. Happy anniversary. Many more to follow. Humphrey? Yeah, let me. Humph! Humph! Now you should give a speech. A response. Now, please, Ocky, sit down. No, I want to speak. No, You're gonna make a speech. speech, Humphrey. It's traditional. It's what Harriet. It's what your mother would have wished. Oh dear, I don't think she should have said that. Friends, I am encouraged by my cousin Florence to address you. I intend to be brief. Turn down the music, Mary. We meet tonight to celebrate a special anniversary. Yeah, yeah. But in our celebrating, let us not forget our debt to the past. Until two years ago, as you know, Seton Manor had long been mourning its true mistress, my mother Harriet. Let us remember that it was my mother who breathed life, who fat. She, from whose loving touch no nook or cranny was spared. She, whose spirit even now I sense within, encircling us at dinner. Ooh, he's a Though her body is passed from us, let us not forget her. Yeah, yeah. But then, exactly two years ago, I finally caught my beautiful Salome and brought her home. She is young in years. And, like a pretty little moth, must bat against the light that Harriet has left behind. But before you all tonight, I make this solemn vow. My house I hold most dear, my estate I hold most dear, and my wife, my most valued possession, I also hold most dear. I have her and in time-honoured fashion, I will keep her. I offer a toast to us, to life, to death, and to the hereafter. There's your speech, Florence, and I trust my beloved Salome that your appetite for occasion is duly sated. Ladies and gentlemen, if you care to make your way back to the house, I'll organise the sweet trolley to be brought out on the terrace. Care for a little snifter while we await the arrival of coffee, Tom? Mm, jolly nice of you, old boy. What you got? Oh, a nice armagnac, a fine malt. Uh, malt will do fine. Nothing like a drop of the to round off a perfect Thank evening. You. Oh, Heather, we haven't had a chance to talk yet. Did you enjoy the meal? Delicious. Your wife is such an excellent... Tell me, excellent. how's your son getting out of oh, the bar? Oh, he's doing very well. Oh, I'm so splendid. proud of him. Sorry to interrupt you, Humphrey, but could you direct me to the little girl's room? Uh, sorry? The... Little girl's room? Oh, you mean the lavatory, Heather. <laughs> when you reach the house, up the stairs, straight in front of you, and it's the first door on the right. <laughs> oh, by the way, forgive the smell there. We've only just... Decorating. Thank you, dear. Uh, didn't you see too much bubbling? <laughs> oh, and Heather, yes. if you need a hand towel, they're in the large closet just behind the bathroom door. Just help uh, yourself. Yes, I will. Now, Major, what about that malt? <laughs> Sal, are you all right? Of course. Why? Humphrey's little speech back there was an outrage. I thank you not to insult my husband, not while you're here as his guest. I'm not his guest, and he's under no illusion about that either. Oh, people always misunderstand. He was just being funny, that's all. Funny? Oh, I see. Just as he was about the 13 people at dinner, upsetting Mrs Fleming with all that talk of death and superstition. Oh, now you're going over the top. Heather knows Humphrey better than anyone. Enough to think him strange at times. Eccentric. What do you mean? Oh, come on, Sal, he's warped. His whole behaviour makes it so blatantly obvious. He's contemptuous of everyone here tonight. And what's worse, that contempt clearly extends to you. He has no regard for your feelings. That is he... quite enough. He's worth ten of you put together. That's not true. There's something very wrong here. 
I can't quite put my finger on it, but the whole place exudes a sense of misery and oppression. I felt it as soon as I arrived yesterday. And Humphrey's performance tonight has convinced me I'm right. Oh, that's nonsense, John. Now stop it. You know I'm talking sense, Sal. You felt it too. That's why you wrote to me. No. Wanted to see me. Insisted I should come and stay. You could have told me when you said you wouldn't feel settled until I'd visited you here. And now I realise why. <sighs> this is no marriage of kindred souls. There's no love here. With some kind of bondage. I love him, John. Love him. Good Lord, did you hear that? Sounds like some wretched animal caught in a trap. Do you keep any animals? No, nothing like that. That Humphrey detests them. Anyone seen Heather? I think she went into the house, to the bathroom. She wasn't sure of the way. Oh, it, it's upstairs. Andrew, I think your wife's been taken ill. Oh, yeah. Come on, we must go inside. Oh. Um, yes. Where's Humphrey? Humphrey? Oh, where are you? Quick, uh... Which way's the bathroom? Uh, upstairs. Follow me. Uh, where's the light? Uh, it's switched at the other end. Uh, I'll lead you. We furbished the first floor. We decided to keep the main bathroom there. Humphrey's mother used it. Next door to her rooms are very convenient. Are we, are we there yet? Uh, it's just at the top here. Put a light on. I can't see a thing. Oh, this is the bathroom here. The switch is outside somewhere. Yes, we'll have to feel for it. Uh, found it. Oh my God! There are there are moths everywhere. Heather! Oh, oh, she's here! Oh dear God! They're all over her. Quickly, give me a hand. We've got to get them off. Oh, there are her eyes everywhere. Oh, what a bit. All right, Heather. All right, you'll soon be okay. I'm going to try to get a window open and get these things out of here. Heather, it, it's Salome. Can you hear me? And you're you're all right. You're going to be fine. You've, you've had a bad shock. Just, just sit here with me for a while, and you will be up soon. When you're better, we'll go downstairs. Oh, my God, what's happened? Oh, well, somehow Heather's stumbled onto some of Humphrey's yeah, marks. What's going on? Don't just stand there like some great gormless lump. The old girl needs branding. <laughs> Heather! No, it's all right, it's all right, Mr. Fenwick. The wife's had a bit of a shock, but she's fine. Oh, it's all right, it's all right. They're gone, they're all gone. You're safe. You're safe now, darling. Where earth could these have come from? There's hundreds of them. They're Humphreys. He collects them. But I can't think how they got to the I couldn't help they came out with this muttering. They were suffocating. It's just a little accident. They'll soon have you right as rain. Oh, girl. I thought I was going to die. You better get her into the fresh air. Yes, of course. Here, yeah, perhaps you and Ted can uh, take her downstairs. Right, yes. Andrew, that there's some smelling salts downstairs in the kitchen, but please take some. I've a number of a good emergency doctor in Burswilden. I say, anyone notice the smell? For a moment, I thought the old girl had, well, you know, when someone's had a bad shock, perfectly normal. Yes, I noticed it too. Sickly, sweet. Something has very decidedly gone off. It seems to be strongest over here. Now, wait a minute. I guess there's uh, there's something at the bottom of this closet. Uh, has anyone got any matches? No, 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 it doesn't matter. I can reach inside. Oh, what is it? Something warm and, uh, and moving. Moving? Th th stand back, everyone. Whatever it is, I think it's best to drag it out into the open. Ah. Oh. What is it? It's a dead dog. And very badly decomposed. It's seething with maggots. How on earth did it get in here? Oh, I expect Humphrey put it there. Oh, I can't stand any more of this. I'm going to get to myself a brandy. What do you mean, Humphrey put it there? In a bathroom cupboard, for God's sake. Well, some of his moths are carrion feeders. They, they need flesh for food. Humphrey's told me that before now. He must have put the dog here. God knows who the poor thing belonged to. Look, it's still got a collar around its neck. And where the hell is Humphrey? He called us all in here. What does it matter, John? Let's just get rid of it and forget about this. Forget? Oh, that would be too easy. Yes, let's forget. While some poor defenceless old lady lies half delirious downstairs because of your husband's disgusting hobbies. Never in a lifetime. Look, just be... Unusual? More than unusual. I'll tell you what your husband's tastes are. The perverse. 
I'm beginning to realize some of the rumors about him are probably true. This is no marriage, Sal. It's some hideous, bizarre charade. When I leave this room, I'm going straight downstairs and out through that front door. And I want you to come with me. Sal! What is the matter? Why are you so frightened? I can't, John. I can't believe him. I, I love him. It's a lie. You can't possibly love him. I do. I do. <laughs> Listen to him. The man is mad. He's not safe, Sal. Come with me now while there's still time. No, I can't. Please. I can't. Please. You can't make me. You don't understand. <laughs> and I can't help you. No. No, don't leave me. I can't do any more. You've made your choice. You're free to do so. I loved you. I lost you. I found you again. And now... Oh, no, John, don't. I beg of you. Don't go tonight. You, you just don't understand. God be with you, Salome. You must live this nightmare alone. <laughs> Why? Why have you done this to me? For better, for worse. Why did you upset our guests? Where were you when Heather had her accident? I'm a Lorelei in reverse. I lure them onto rocks. They crash upon the rocks of life into the tides of death. <laughs> no. Oh my God. Don't you think I look fetching today, my love? Isn't it a beautiful dress? Where did you find that, Humphrey? Take it off. Oh, you know my son, I see. Your son? That's right. He's a good boy. Stop it. This is grotesque. Stop it, Humphrey. Oh, no. I'm not Humphrey Child. My name's Harriet Child. I can wear my hair in a bun now, but I still have a little problem with my beard. Dr. Matthews. <laughs> it's Salome Child. Yes, straight away. I don't know how this started, but he's on the roof and he has a dog and he's threatening to set it alight. <laughs> I'm sorry, my medication can't help anymore. He needs something much stronger. He's going the same way as his mother. You're committed. I fear it's in the blood. You're committed, Dr. Matthews. Mrs. Child, there's every chance your husband is no longer harmless. I believe him to be criminally insane. Criminally insane? Can nothing be done? Nothing. Mrs. Child, it's for the best. We have stronger drugs there. He'll respond. He'll be quite comfortable. No. <laughs> Dr. Matthews! What are they doing? Trying to give him an injection to calm him down. It happens in these cases. Oh, what's happened now? He's all right. I must go to him. Mrs. Child. Oh, my God! I'm afraid the straitjacket was necessary. I really didn't want you to see. But you did want to see, didn't you, Salome? Ah, see how my moth flutters now. You may think I'm mad, but I tell you, I know secrets of the universe you couldn't even guess. Come away, Mrs. Child, this is all too distressing. That's right, Mrs. Child. Do what the nice man says. But wherever they take you, I shall find you. You're mine, Salome, forever. You promise me, till death us do part, remember? And I tell you, death shall not part us. Not part us. Not death. Humphrey Child seemed preoccupied by death and dying. For six months you tried to save him, then you wrote again, again begging me to help. I couldn't believe what he'd done to you. That haunted look. I wanted to take you away. But again, you insisted on staying. Even in madness, he had a good sense of timing. 
as though he was playing with us all. Then suddenly, for you, my darling, that merciful release. Only called to pass on our respects. When did it happen? Of course, I blame her. Never really gave the poor man a chance. If you ask me, she only married him for his money. It's obvious she didn't love him. He was too good for her. I want only a small affair. Just ashes family. to ashes, dust to dust. Humphrey Ramsden Child, five years beloved husband of Salome Clare Child. Death shall not part us. Shall not part us. I have her. And in time-honoured fashion I shall keep her. Keep her. Keep her. Three weeks after the funeral, you became my wife. A quiet affair, you insisted, nothing grand. I, John Temple, take thee, Salome Clare Child, to be my lawful wedded wife. I, Salome Clare Child, take thee, John Temple, to be my lawful wedded husband. But how I drank in your smiles, and the promise that we were alone now for the rest of our lives, I was determined to savour every moment. Our honeymoon should have been perfect. Oh, you're very bright this morning. And why not? Mm. Mm. <laughs> I feel the sun shining on me. Suddenly life is good. I'm happy and fulfilled. And I've got my pipe, a tin of my favourite backy. Oh, <laughs> yes, and I've got my girl Sal. Mm. <laughs> Careful! Oh, the oh, eggs! Oh, it's all right, save them. <laughs> oh, you're a romantic, John Temple. I always suspected it beneath all that tweed and pipe smoke. If a fellow can't be romantic on his own honeymoon, then there's no justice in the world. Oh, I still can't believe it. It's like a dream. Oh, I'm so frightened I'll wake up and all this will disappear. Now stop all that maudlin business. Right, you ready? Big or little helping of our special scorched scrambled egg. Burnt, more like it. <laughs> <laughs> Coffee? Oh, please. Milk? Mm, just as it comes, you know me. Mm, I like to think I do. <laughs> mm. Oh, delicious. Mm. Can't beat it, really, can you, all this? The isolation? I've loved it all my life. Oh, I never really went sailing. Oh, how we dined on that night. You called it Daisy. Stupid name for a boat. Oh, but he was very fond of it. Used to sail by night, studying moths along the river. Never took me with him. Now, you don't have to think about any of that. It's all past history. You're Mrs John Temple now. Oh, I know. It makes me feel very safe somehow. Really? <laughs> of course. Have I behaved very selfishly? Why? Making you a marriage offer at a time when I knew it would be hard for you to refuse. John, they took Humphrey away over a year ago. But during that last 12 months of his life, well, he was in no sense of the word a husband to me. Oh, he used to get very abusive. And that business of dressing up like a woman, well... In the end, I think he really believed he was his mother. Darling, please. No, no, it, it's good to tell you, it, it helps. He always used to say he'd find me, though. Wherever you are, little moth, I'll find you. I was always the worst bit, like a threat. I used to lie awake at nights, anxious, in case he escaped and came looking for me. It's silly, isn't it? I don't think so. You know, when you finally wrote to me after Humphrey went away, I, I felt as if I'd been rescued. Oh, I can't describe the sense of relief. But I kept my word. I only had to wait for the inevitable, and I knew you might accept me at last. I knew it was just a question of time. What's that line? There's a destiny that shapes our ends, rough hew them how we will, or something like that. Oh, you show off. No, not really. <laughs> I just want to make up for all the time we've missed, introduce you to all my old haunts. So that's why you wanted to come here. We needed somewhere private. What could be more perfect? Alone mm. on Windhover too. <laughs> it was the perfect solution, our own little island. Set in a silver sea. Mm -hmm. I see more like. I had a dip when I got up. Talk about goose pimples. Good job I've got a strong heart. All the better for having me in it. Mm. <laughs> Happy? Oh, I think so. Only think so. It was a bit of a shock last night, passing Seton Manor. Mm, too many ghosts, you mean? I 
I hadn't been back since the day Humphrey was taken to the asylum. At the time I simply walked out and left it, but it still came as a shock. I suppose I hadn't realised just how close we'd be. I only called you on deck to see those gannets flying against that brilliant sunset. Never even noticed the house. Strange, it, it wasn't the memories upset me. It was the way the place had deteriorated that hit me most. The whole place seemed to be rotting. I almost felt it was watching me. Angry at me for going away. <laughs> Good Lord! What on earth was that? Some bloody idiots round the side. <laughs> you stupid fool! Why didn't you look what you're doing? Oh, sorry we bumped into you, old man. Wife had a spot of trouble with the oars. What is it, darling? I told you! Lawrence! I said to Ted, I thought I'd seen Salome, child. I saw you, not a care in the world, taking the sun, weren't you, yesterday morning? Of uh, course you were. I knew it was you. That's why I said to Ted, didn't I? Uh, I said, if yes, we need some you. shackles, why don't we row the dinghy over tomorrow morning and find out if that white boat's got any to spare? And if it is Salome, child, I said, she'll... Me. This lady isn't Mrs. Child anymore. She's my wife. My name is Temple, John Temple. We don't have any spare shackles, and if you don't mind, right now I'd like to inspect the damage. Oh, dear, dear, we appear to have put our foot in it as yes. usual. Deary me, yeah, well, I I simply never. didn't realise so soon after poor old John, husband. darling, this is Florence Scrivener and her husband Edward. Uh, Ted, please. How do you do? He was a bit scraped about the stern. Didn't we meet once at my cousin Hump's place, Seaton? I don't remember. Of course we did. Same night old Ma Fleming took a wrong turn and got bats or something. No, no, moths, dear. Lots of giant moths. Oh, well, something flappy. Would you like to come on board? John was just making some coffee. Oh, no, I don't think that's a very good idea, especially after the paint business. We really ought to be on our way, Oki. Oh, nice running into you again. Oh, <laughs> Listen to that, running into you. <laughs> Mind you, I wouldn't have recognised the old tub. Tarted it up a bit by the looks of things. Much better shape than I remember it. Humph had it painted pink, as I recall. This is not Humphrey's boat, it's mine. And honestly, we don't have any shackles to spare. Oh, don't worry about that. We'll make out somehow. Well, well, you know, I can't believe it. Humph dead and buried not long since. And look at you now, dear. Positively blooming. Oh. How long is it since? A month. Florence, almost to the day. After all, you should know. I seem to remember you were at the funeral in full black. Really? Only a month? How interesting! He was a remarkable man, my cousin. Very remarkable. I wonder what he would make of his little Salome remarrying quite so soon. My wife's name is Salome, as you well know. <laughs> OK, time we were going. I'd stay the old welcome and all that. Oh, never could stand pussyfooting around. Sorry about the paint. Goodbye, Salome. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Hateful woman. Mm, he was trying to stop her. Is the damage bad? No, not really. Just scraped off the paint along there. See? So bloody careless. Flaming amateurs. <laughs> <laughs> Quite awful people, those two. Yes, I never liked them. Although Ted seemed all right. I mean, he's quite nice in his own way. You know, I think we'll make a push ahead of schedule. It's getting a bit crowded round here, and I'd like to get to Collett's farm by mid-afternoon. Do you mind? Oh, not a bit. After seeing those two, I feel I want to move away from Seaton for good. <laughs> and I thought we'd left your past behind for good as well. Until later that evening. We'd been sitting on deck after supper when I suddenly spotted that boat again. We'd seen it once already the night before. A curious-shaped thing with cut-down mast, painted an awful sort of pink and exuding an air of neglect. I was joking about people's taste when you abruptly said it was too cold to stay on deck and went below. What are you looking at? Nothing. Come on, what was it? These ones, some photos. Old photos of Seaton and the boat I, I, I was just you seeing... You mean his boat? Is this where he used to sail? Yes, now and then. Sometimes he kept it not far from here. Oh, John, John, it, it's hot, but I don't know how these came to be here at all. I found them in my suitcase when I um, unpacked it. It's almost as if someone put them there. Someone... Sal, it's all over. Humphrey <laughs> Child is dead. Everything is all right, isn't it? Oh, I suppose so. Of course it is. Look, you hop into bed. Give me those, and I'll tear them up. Chuck them overboard. Commit them to the waves. <laughs> and then I'll join you for an early night. 
we can wash up in the morning. Salome. <laughs> Sal 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 it's okay. It's okay. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Nothing can hurt you. my girl. Start by coming clean about that boat we saw. It's Humphrey's old bark, isn't it? I think so. What do you mean, think so? You know it is. Oh, yes. You recognised right. it when we saw it last yes, night. Yes, all right. I did. But what was the point in telling you? I knew you'd be upset, and besides, I'm convinced it's following me. Oh, brilliant. We see the same boat two times, and now it's following No! I've seen it more than twice. The first night we docked at Skippers, I saw it then. I thought nothing of it, but when it appeared the next evening, I, I began to worry. You said nothing? Nothing? I am your husband, remember? That doesn't mean you own me. You can't order me to tell you everything. But you are coming with me right now. We're going to take the dinghy, and we're going on board that pink wreck. You are going to meet the people who have obviously hired it for a holiday. And you're going to set these bloody, stupid ideas about phantom ships pursuing you right back to Davy Jones's locker where they belong. No! No, please don't make me! I beg of you, Humphrey! What did you call me? I'm sorry. You oh, called I'm me, sorry. You called me Humphrey. For a moment, it was Humphreys. It's gone. The blight is gone. I saw it. It was there only five minutes ago. You'll let off this time, Sal. But the next time we see that wretched boat. Last night, we need to talk. I know. There are so many things I haven't told you, but I was trying to forget the past, like you said, and not let my memories upset me. I shouldn't have lost my temper. I'm sorry. It was unforgivable. Oh, it wasn't like you. I've never heard such anger in your voice before, such intensity. I didn't believe you could be so violent. Yes, it scared me too. I just completely lost control. I'm very sorry. It'll never happen again. Never. I, I, I promise. <gasps> Um. Look, I, I know it's nonsense, but Humphrey's face last night, it was so vivid, so real. And it was here again this morning, the moth. I felt it touching my mouth, I felt it, Sally, I felt it crawling Sally. over my skin and I heard it no, beating its no, wings. No. Oh, John, I didn't tell you the whole truth last night. I have seen Humphrey's boat twice, but I was so frightened. It seemed to rise up slowly out of the water. What? I didn't tell you because... But how? It looked more and more decayed, more broken up, as if possessed by something rotten and evil. I wouldn't... I can't explain. I was drawn to it. I, it was waiting for me, watching me. I could sense something drawing me down into the water. It's calling me. But 
don't let me go. You mustn't trust me. Do you understand? You must stop me. Whatever happens, stop me. We must return to land now. Immediately. Very well. I want to be locked in. Locked in the cabin. But I... If you don't, it will claim me without question. He will claim me. He really did love me, you know. And I love you too. Remember that. <laughs> You're safe now, darling. Nothing can claim you. About another half mile, Sal, and we can land. Can't say I won't be relieved to put ashore. My cop! My cop, what was that? She, she's out of control. Swinging to port. Stop. Humphrey's boat, rising out from the water, rotted almost through. My God, the speed! Salome, Salome, death shall not part us. You shall not have her. She's mine, and mine she shall stay. Humphrey's voice. I swear I heard it. What? Oh my God! It's one of those giant moths. No, not my mouth. I've come to claim what's mine, Salome. Till death us do part, my dear. Oh, no, Humphrey. I'm not ready. Oh, please, please leave me alone. John, John, help me! Open the door, please. He can't hear you, my beloved. He has thoughts only for his precious boat. Come with me now. I've come to take you home. To my son. It's over, Sal. We're all right. It's over. Sally. Sally. Sal! Sal! Sally! Sally! Oh no. Oh no, not that, please God. Not that. You'd gone, of course. Though there was no sign of a struggle, nothing at all to suggest that you'd ever been there. Just a moth on your pillow, broken, dying. It was as if you'd never been my wife, Salome, never existed, just nothing, no body, no grave, nothing. All I have left is my heart, my memory. sea, and only the sea, has yours. I have her, and in time-honored fashion I shall keep her, keep her, keep her. Robert Glenister played John, Helena Breck, Salome, and David March Humphrey in Mortmain by John Metcalf. Florence, Anne Windsor, Edward, Ronald Herdman, Heather, Gudrun Ewer, Andrew, Jonathan Adams, Tom, John Church. Mortmain was dramatized by Rebecca Wilmshurst and directed by Martin Jenkins. <laughs>